Cool. OK, um, so I'm going to be presenting some work that we've done with inside of NIME. So I did this together with Anna and Daria um, on the Monster Model Factory. Um, we created a bit of a mystery with the name here. Um, so we intentionally didn't clarify what exactly a Monster Model Factory is. So let's start with that. So lay a bit of the groundwork. What is a Monster Model Factory? The first thing that might come to mind is the factory where they make these things. Um, and you know, it's obvious, right? It's the factory where they make monster models. Of course, it's not that. Um, so what could it be? Let's look at the individual words. Here's a definition of monster. Um, this is from the Merriam-Webster's. Uh, there's a couple different definitions here. Um, I'm going to go with the, I'm going to go with, I don't have a pointer. Um, all right. Uh, I'll go with the thing of extraordinary or daunting size. So this is what we're going to use for monster. Uh, the next dictionary we're going to go to is the NIME dictionary, uh, which is model factory. So a model factory is a tool for automating the process of building, validating, and deploying a group of predictive models using NIME. So now the question, what is a monster model factory? Well, we just put the two together. So a monster model factory is a tool for automating the process of building, validating, and deploying a daunting number of predictive models using NIME. All right, so now we know where we're going. Who cares? The answer was I actually had 1,500 data sets. It was more than 1,500 data sets that I wanted to build models for. Um, and I'll explain later why I wanted to do that. Um, I want to build those models, but I, then I also actually want to use the models. So I don't just want to build them to see how quite fast our learning algorithms are or how accurate they are. I want to do something with them. So I need to build them and deploy them. Um, the whole process needs to be automated and reproducible so that when the database that I pulled these 1,500 data sets from, when that is updated in six months, I can repeat the process. Right, if it takes the three of us two weeks to build all the models and we have to repeat that again in six months, it's a disaster. So it all needs to be automated. So let's go back to the beginning and think about what we're going to do here. You already saw this slide. Uh, Michael introduced the idea of CRISP-DM. Um, this is this great, very generic way of thinking about building models. What we start with is business understanding. We need to understand what the problem is we're trying to solve and what we want to do with the results once we solve the problem. Then we need to figure out the data that's out there, what's, what data is available to help solve the problem. For that, we need to prepare the data so that we can actually model it. Um, as any of you who do data science know, you never find data sets that you can just model directly, well, except for from Kaggle. Um, generally, you can't find data sets that you can model directly. Real-world data, you have to get ready. We're going to do the modeling. We'll go back and forth probably a few times here. Then we're going to evaluate all of that and see how we did. Uh, we need to make sure that the model that we built actually solves the problem we were trying to solve. And we need to make sure it solves it well enough that we're happy to keep it. Once we do that, we can deploy it. Instead of drawing the circle all the time, it takes up a lot of space. We're going to unroll this a little bit and rename the steps a little bit. We'll talk about an initialization step. That's understanding the problem understanding where the data is. We're going to load the data, transform it, learn from it, score it, evaluate it, and deploy it. We want to implement all of that in NIME. So this is a simple NIME workflow for doing basically what I just described. Once we've understood the data, we're going to go in and load it. Uh, we'll then do transformation. Here's that learn predict pattern that you keep seeing over and over again. So we learn, score. Um, I'm going to wave my hands about that for the moment. Uh, and then we're going to deploy it. You can imagine this is a NIME workflow. It's pretty easy. I can just run this for one data set and then run it for the next one. And it's all more or less automated. The trick is this guy. Um, really, what happens here most of the time is a human being does that. Right? So I build the model. I score it. I take a look at the results. I decide whether or not I like that or not. And if so, I deploy it. And that works pretty well for a few models, right? I can look at four or five models and be comfortable with it and understand what's going on and make good decisions. However, once we get beyond that, um, I start to reach the end of what I can do. And even with Daria and Anna's help, I, you know, that's, we just can't do it. So if we really want to get to a daunting number of models, you can't have a human being in the process. You just cannot feasibly do that manually. So we need a way to automate the evaluation step. So we need to take this workflow that had all of those automatable pieces and include evaluation in that. Once we've done that, we're in pretty good shape, right? I can take a data set. I can click Go and NIME, and it runs through. It evaluates. It deploys it, and I have a model. So that's pretty nice. 
but now I encounter the next problem. I said I have 1,500 models. Do I have to load each of them individually? With one or two, I can do that, but with all 1,500, um, we start to get to the monsters again, right? Things get a little bit daunting. So we need to get beyond this. Uh, we need to be able to not manually deal with this daunting number of models. We need to automate the whole process. So this is the theme for the whole monster model factory. We need to automate all the things. We can't just do pieces. Fortunately, on this stage last year, um, Iris and Phil introduced a way to do that, which is the model process factory. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the video with the fantastic music where you can really get a sense of the wonderful Star Trek uniforms that they were wearing. Um, Iris, you don't have that with you this time, do you? Ah. Uh. Um, and I apologize, I don't have any kind of Star Trek or monster uniform or whatever. I, it just doesn't work with me. Phil is the only one that can pull that off. Anyway, they introduced the idea of the model process factory. There was a nine blog post about this, and there's a white paper as well. Um, the slides will be available. You guys can find these pretty easily. Um, but the idea is we take that workflow that we showed before, and we set it up in such a way that we automate the entire process, including running it across multiple rows of a table. Um, so each of these steps is a separate workflow, and we're going to use NIME to orchestrate the calling of all of those workflows. There's going to be a lot more detail on this tomorrow. Um, so today I'm going to give you an overview of what we did and talk about what we're going to do next. Tomorrow in the life sciences session, if you want to hear about the guts, it's going to be a little bit life science-y, so there's going to be some real chemistry in there. We'll talk more about how the, the actual details of this work. I'll come to that in a moment. So what did we actually do? Um, I mentioned there's 1,500 data sets. Those come from Campbell, which is a public data source. Um, we created workflows for each of the steps, so to automatically extract data, um, data sets from the database, to automatically generate features for each of those, to automate the model building and validation, to deploy all of the models that pass the validation, um, and then to automate the execution of that whole thing with the model factory. Once we've done that, once we've built the 1,500 models, we deploy those to the NIME server. We deploy them in three different ways. So there's a web portal application that shows you the details about an individual model, about how it did. Uh, we have a REST service to generate predictions. So you give it a new uh, molecule where you're asking a question about, or a number of new molecules, and you get the 1,500 predictions. Uh, and we have a web portal application that allows you to view those. And I'll show you bits of each of those as we go along. Let's start at the beginning, the data source. Um, I mentioned Kemble already. This is, uh, uh, for my field, so the chemistry informatics field, this is the primary public data source. Um, it contains chemical and biological data collected from the scientific literature. It's in a fantastic data warehouse form, so with a bunch of linked tables that you can understand. It works really well with the NIME nodes, uh, the NIME database querying nodes. Uh, we have this all set up in a PostgreSQL database that's running in Amazon, um, and then we do a bunch of queries from NIME. We started this whole process with an exploratory activity where we're building the business understanding, where we're going through um, the database and we're doing a bunch of queries in order to understand what kind of data are there, what are the data sets that we can pull out, what makes sense. And that's how we got to these 1,500 data sets, was this it was a day or two of kind of exploring the data and querying it and looking at it and thinking about what was available. Once we've done that, um, this is what came out. So this is an example of the, the results. This is the first few rows of that table. You can see for each of these, each of these rows is a model we're going to build. We have an identifier from the database for the data set. We have the type of data that we're modeling. There's a text field here that if you know a bit of biology or chemistry, it makes some sense. And then there's a bunch of other identifiers and statistics, statistics about the data set. We're now ready to load that. Remember the steps in the process. We start with init, and we're now going to move on to load. In order to do that, we have a workflow that queries the data warehouse that pulls all of the data for that um, data set out and brings it into NIME, and then gets it into a single table, the data and the metadata for that data set so that we can then go on and build the model. And this is just what that data looks like. Um, bit of chemistry here, Michael, cover your eyes. Uh, the molecules that we're going to be working with come out in this strange text format here. Um, those of you who are old enough, this maybe looks like line noise that you used to see from your modem. Um, those of you who are chemists, you may know what this is. This is a representation of the molecule. We need to take that in, load it, 
turn it into something um, that the computer can understand as an actual molecule, and then take that and turn it into a form that we can feed into a machine learning algorithm. Because neither the deep learning approaches, nor H2O, nor any of the great stuff in NIME can directly take a molecule and do anything with it. Right? We have to generate features for that. And that's this transform step. Once we've done that, we're ready to learn. So we might have for our data set, we have pulled the data from the database, we've transformed it, we're now ready to learn. There was a great question previously about what do you do if you have a new data set? Um, and the answer is you try a bunch of things and see what works. We need to automate that process. So what we're doing is we've tried four different machine learning algorithms. Um, this is in the experience that I have. One of these is likely to work if anything will. So we take four that are kind of a broad sampling. We're using random forests. We're using logistic regressions. We're using um, the statistic gradient boosting uh, that is available in H2O. And we're using naive Bayes. So with these three, three of them are NIME implementations. Gradient boosting is the H2O implementation. We have a pretty good sampling of different kinds of algorithms. Um, all of these have parameters that need to be optimized. So we have a parameter optimization loop, um, just like what you saw in the previous presentation that Martin showed. We have a parameter optimization loop. And so for each of the combinations of algorithm plus fingerprint, we do parameter optimization and pick the best result. That's our learning step. So there's 20 different models that we build and parameter optimization for each of those 20 different models for each of the 1,500 data sets. So you can already start to get a sense that this actually really is daunting. Um, this is not a small amount of work. This is what the workflow looks like at a very high level. Again, more details tomorrow um, in the guts session. Uh, we have basically we partition the data. You saw this already. So we have a training set and a validation set. We feed into each of these four learning algorithms. The parameter optimization loop is inside each of these. Each of these has different parameters, and you do the optimization in a different way, so they're all broken out separately. We pick the best model, um, and then we score it using that external data. This is the score step of that entire process. Now, at the end of this, we have the best possible model that we can build for that data set. We have the scoring functions available to us, and we now need to evaluate whether or not that model's any good. Um, this is super important because we want to deploy models that are actually useful, right? If the model is garbage, there's no point in putting it out there. There's no point in having people get predictions from a model that we know is trash. So we want to take a very close look at each of these, well, in an automated way, take a very close look at each of these models and make sure it's of high enough quality to put out there. This is a human visible version of the report that we do. Um, so we spent a lot of time doing this. This is built from NIME. This is just a custom series of JavaScript views put together in a web portal application. It's a very detailed view on how the model does on its testing set. So we have a confusion matrix, and we have some performance metrics. And what we've done is by looking at a number of data sets and getting a sense of what kind of accuracies we want, we've come up with a number of a different evaluation criteria based on these AUC and enrichment metrics. If these are high enough, we say the model's good and let it go forward. If not, we flag it in an automated way as bad and don't generate predictions with it anymore. OK. We're done, which is great, right? Um, at least I first started thinking we were done. Um, Daria and Anna were looking at me a little bit funny. Um, I was wondering what's missing. And then I remembered something. Um, this tweet from Rosaria talking about deployment. Um, this is a great tweet if people haven't seen it. Um, so we, I built a bunch of models, right? And I need to get it out there so we can actually use it. So we need to, in addition to doing the automation of the modeling, we need to actually deploy all of those models. So let's move on to that step. OK, remember the goal of the exercise wasn't just to build the models as much as maybe that was what I was interested in. Uh, we need to deploy them. We're going to do that with the server. Uh, we'll do two different deployment strategies, one for machines, so we deploy the models as a web service, and one for people. So we deploy the models with a nice visualization. This is what the, how the web service works. John showed one of these workflows before. Um, we have a very generic NIME workflow. This reads the models in. This generates predictions. Um, I could use this in NIME by itself, or I could put nodes in that know how to deal with JSON and is input, and know that how to provide JSON as output. And now all of a sudden, I have a web workflow that if I put it on the server, it's a REST web service, and I can call it from anywhere. 
down below is an example of what part of the output looks like if I call that from inside of a standard um, REST web service application. And you can see this is something you would not want to show to a human being, right? I'm, I'm a geek, but I don't want to read through this. Um, but it's great if I'm building another application. I get all the possible values. There's 1,500 models. There's three different numbers for each of them. I can drown in it and present it however I want. For people, we want to do something a little bit more useful. Um, so for people, we wanted to show them something you know, that looks nice. Uh, this is inspired by the new Kemba web interface, something that's coming reasonably soon. What we have here is a, is a heat map. Um, each of the rows corresponds to a thing I'm making a prediction for. Each of the columns corresponds to one of the models that I built. So we have IDs in here. These are IDs of the, the compounds provided by the user. These are the IDs of the assays. And each of these boxes is a prediction probability that the compound is likely to be active. So we can kind of look at this and find the interesting models uh, for a particular compound. We're going to get into this in excruciating de sorry, um, wonderful detail tomorrow, show all of the things you can do with this, including a live demo. I am not brave enough to do that right now. I used all of that bravery up this morning. Um, so it slides. Um, we also have this model report. I showed you this already. Just a little bit to this. Um, you can get to this from the visualization. So when you click on one of these tabs, if you as a user are curious about what the model is, you can click on the link at the top. You get a brief description and a link to this model report. So if I see the prediction and I see something where the compound is flagged as likely to be active, I can go drill into that, get the details about how accurate the model was, and get a sense as to whether or not I should believe that. Down at the bottom, I also get a bunch of details about the model, um, the metadata on the data set pulled from the database, and information on the right-hand side um, information about the model itself. So this was a random forest uh, built using this particular fingerprint, and those are the parameters that came out of the optimization loop. So I have everything I would want to know about the model available uh, for people who want to drill into the results. So that was all theory. Let me tell you where we really are so far. Um, so we've identified all the data sets. We've built all of those individual workflows. We can show you those tomorrow. Um, we've tied them all together into the model process factory. We've set up the deployment and reporting workflows. We'll show all of you that tomorrow. We've done a 300 model trial run without the parameter optimization. We haven't actually run all 1,500 models with all 20 different possibilities in the parameter optimization. For that, we're waiting for the distributed executors. Right? I'm running that on one server, I figured it out probably take about a week or a week and a half. I would much rather run that across a bunch of servers and get the results more quickly. And then the Uber next step, um, those of you who are know what this word actually should be in English, the step after next, um, please let me know. I could only come up with Uber next, um, is to analyze the models. So it's interesting to get those out there and deploy them and have people use them. As a chemistry data geek, I am really interested in seeing which models do well with which types of data sets, because I think that there's a lot that we can learn about our methods from this, because it's a very large collection of real world data sets. OK. Um, the cool thing is the distributed executors are in the cloud, so we're going to be running the monster in the cloud, um, which, OK, I think that's funny. Um, so more details. This is the link to the blog post. There's the white paper. The original model process management um, that Rose, uh, Rosaria, Iris, and Phil presented last year, those are already on our example server, so you can get to this inside of NIME. When we're done with all of this, when we have the monster in the cloud, um, we will have blog posts and sample workflows for what we've done here as well. Again, if you want to see the guts of the monster, um, please come tomorrow during the life sciences session. Um, I will talk about that together with Anna and Dare, who actually did the hard work. Um, Michael said that I could show some molecules at the end. I didn't, wasn't originally planning on doing this, but it's great. Thanks, Michael. Um, they're not too scary. We had monsters before they're worse. Um, so we have sugar up at the top. This may look scary, but it's just sugar. It's not bad. Um, this guy actually does look scary. This is tetrodotoxin. Um, it's the stuff that's in pufferfish uh, liver. So if you get to, uh, pufferfish sushi and the chef has made a mistake, you die. Um, and that's why. Um, this is dimethylmercury. It looks really simple. It doesn't look particularly scary. This is one of the most potent neurotoxins known to man. It's really, really simple, but it's really, really bad. Um, so scary looking things aren't always scary. And then the last one at the bottom, this is Diavan, which is a blood pressure medication. I hope that none of you need that after seeing the picture of the four molecules. Um, 
So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>